I suppose we better get started then. If you guys would join me in a word of prayer before we get going here. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you that we are able to be here to learn about this literature that you provided for us, that, that so many people have worked hard to, to, again, provide us, and please help us to read it in a way present it to others in a way that glorifies you. Everything that we do is to your glory. And I thank you for this beautiful literature that we have so we may analyze it and go into deeper discussions about it so we may teach it to those who have heard the gospel, preach to those who know these gospel stories, and so on. And with all of that in mind, in your son's name that we pray, amen. All right, so I mentioned this before. I'm going to be going on a little bit of a departure. Our question for the whole class is what does a story do? Not exactly what does it say or how does it say it, but what does it do? And I just want you to hold that before you as we go on. This week we'll be understanding, howdy, we'll be understanding uh, Luke chapter 15. If you remember that there are three scenes that work here. We noticed this earlier in the class, but notice this in the chiasm, which we went over a while ago. There are two scenes that say a call to discipleship in two separate areas, and this is in Luke what we, what we uh, looked at. The first one is in chapter 12, verse 49, uh, through chapter 13, verse 9, and then the section that we are in today in Luke 15. And think of how we may use this comparison to situate our passage as well. Locating our passage in chapter 15 means we have to provide context for it, which I'm arguing comes from chapter 12, like I said. So in chapter 12, verses 49 to 13, verse 9, Jesus speaks of reading signs and clearing debts before reaching chapter 13, where he then speaks of a call to repentance. Reading signs, clearing debts, and then a call to repentance. I imagine after noticing that, you can witness the pattern in its full context and understand Luke 15 in light of chapter 12 and 13. And why the author, who I'm basing my work off of, actually calls both of these sections, 12 and 13 and 15, a call to discipleship in the first place. Both do actually act as a call to discipleship and repentance both. Again, notice that particularly Lucan theme of uh, repentance. It's flooded our texts up until this point, and it hasn't necessarily gone away. So first, before we get into our passage, let's go to chapter 12, verse 49, just so we can read this. Starting in verse 49, and it says, and this is Jesus talking, I have come to bring fire on earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is finished. Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, there will be five in one household divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, so on and so forth. Now in verse 54, Jesus also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you say at once, a rainstorm is coming, and it does. And when you see the south wind blowing, you will say, there will be scorching heat, and there is. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but how can you not know how to interpret the present time? Now to verse 57. And why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, so that he will not drag you before the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. Now in chapter 13. Now there were some present on that occasion who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. He answered them, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered these things? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. Or those 18 who were killed when the tower in Siloam fell on them. Uh, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who live in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as well. So he read the rest of this uh, 
last week. Now, let's go over into chapter 15. We will start in verses 1 through 3, which say, Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to hear him. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law were complaining. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, if he has a hundred sheep and loses one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go look for the one that is lost until he finds it? Then when he has found it, he places it on his shoulders rejoicing. Returning home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, telling them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my sheep that was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need to repent. On to verse 8. Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep, sweep the house, and search thoroughly until she finds it? Then when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of God's angels over one sinner who repents. And finally, the last parable for today, uh, verse 11, Then Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the shares, the share of this estate that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. After a few days, the younger son gathered together all that he had and left on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth with the wild lifestyle. Then, after he had spent everything, a severe famine took place in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and worked for one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He was longing to eat the carob pods, but the, the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired workers have food enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired workers. So he got up. He went to his father. But while he was still a long way from home, his father saw him, and his heart went out to him. He ran and hugged his son and kissed him. Then his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, Hurry, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now to verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. As he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the slaves and asked what was happening. The slave replied, Your brother has returned and your father has killed the fattened calf because he got his son back safe and sound. But the older son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and appealed to him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have worked like a slave for you, and I never disobeyed your commands. Yet you never gave me even a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and everything that belongs to me is yours. It was appropriate to celebrate and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So between those two, chapters, chapter 12, starting in verse 49, on to 13, verse 9, and all of chapter 15, what are the connections that you notice whenever I say both of these sections are labeled a call to discipleship? What are the connections that you see there between those two? Maybe, why would it be called a call to discipleship, both of these separate passages? The word lost hmm. comes to my mind because that's mentioned uh, in both sections. Mm -hmm. Okay, especially in chapter 15. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You've got, you've got the lost sheep, you've got the lost coin, you've got the lost son. Mm -hmm. So what does that say about a call to discipleship? Go find the lost. Right. But the, the sheep, well, the lost in these three, in chapter 15, are, are not, they were once there. 
they mm -hmm. were once part of the flock. They were once mm -hmm. a possession, a coin was a possession. There was once a son. Mm -hmm. They became lost. So right. we go after those that were part of us and go work to bring them back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In uh, 15, uh, verse 7, in 15, verse mm -hmm. 10, mm -hmm. uh, and in 15, 24, and 32, it makes specific uh, references to rejoicing in mm -hmm. heaven mm. when somebody, when an unbeliever repents and mm -hmm. comes back into the flock. Exactly. Is that anywhere close? Yes. No, absolutely. You've actually caught on to the theme of why all these three passages are such, in, in chapter 15 at least, why these three passages are situated next to each other. But I can confidently say this in chapter 15. This is absolutely a Luke in composition if I've ever seen one. Two of these three parables are in Luke, and only in Luke. The introduction, which we just read, verses 1 through 3, contain two components which actually give us insight into how we might interpret the parable. That, again, is unique to Luke. And this also happens in other areas where it might happen at the beginning. It might show us how to interpret the parable in the beginning or the end, or sometimes both, even. But here in these first three verses, the two components, and let me go back to those, are the occasion and then a transition, the occasion in verses 1 and 2, and occasion in verse 3. The occasion is that the Pharisaic criticism of Jesus' association with outcasts or sinners, as we've uh, noted before, which uh, sinner has a connotation that goes beyond our usual uh, moral interpretations and involves disreputable social status. Um, if you remember Jesus sitting at the table with tax collectors and sinners, the question there was how could Jesus do that and not be in sin, which we've touched on a little bit. But we can also note here that the stance of the Pharisees reflect what we see in the Old Testament. The Old Testament warnings about evildoers, namely, we can see this in Proverbs and Psalms and Isaiah, even in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, which was crystallized in this one rabbinic teaching which says, and the Pharisees would have known about this, it says, let not man associate with the wicked, not even bring him to the law. And that's actually a comment on Exodus 18. But in contrast, Jesus eats with sinners and outcasts because, and we've already been through this, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's Luke chapter 5, verse 32. He enters their house because... Chapter 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So given this, Jesus then gives three parables in response after our introduction. The first of these parables is, I call it the found sheep. I erase, I don't like that the, the, the subtitles in my Bible. I cross it out because I think it's pessimistic. So I say the found sheep, the found coin, and the found son. But I'm sure you've heard it as the lost sheep. And this one is actually paralleled in Matthew chapter 18, also with reference to places like Ezekiel and Psalms. But now uh, uh, Luke's point is clarified, and I'm not speaking of which gospel came first, but Luke's point is clarified by that passage in Matthew 18. In Matthew 18, it's the fourth of five large teaching sections in the first gospel, and it's concerned the relationship of disciples actually to one another in the church, and is addressed specifically to the disciples as well. Verse 12 and 13 of Matthew chapter 18 appear as a part of a unit. And the greater picture, 1 through 14, deals with the little ones, if you remember, in the church. That is the rank and file disciples who are in constant danger of deception from proud and clever people. And the point of this is twofold. One is to say, do not cause a rank and file Christian to sin. And two, if one goes astray, go after them, as we've just touched on. And note that in Matthew uh, chapter 18, the sheep is not lost. It actually goes astray is what the text says. That's Matthew chapter 18, verse 12 and 13. In the conclusion of this passage in Matthew, however, the meaning is that the Heavenly Father does not want any little ones to perish. In Luke, however, only one sheep is lost. So again, like you've just noted, chapter 15 of Luke, verse 7 says, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents 
than over 99 righteous people who have no need to repent. The lost in Luke, at least, are sinners, the outcasts with whom Jesus eats. And these are not my words, but I'm going to quote this. In the Lucan story of the lost sheep, the rejoicing of the shepherd is matched by the rejoicing of friends and neighbors over his having found the lost animal. If his associates join the shepherd in his rejoicing when a lost sheep has been found, how much more should the Pharisees join heaven in its joy over the repentance of a sinner? Jesus says to his critics, Can you join me in my rejoicing over the reclamation of any of the outcasts with whom I eat and drink? Right. And so now, uh, next is the second parable, which starts in verse 8, which is little more than saying the same thing. You might think it says the same thing. The repetition, again, one of our conventions to note when reading Luke from a literary standpoint, is that this repetition is for emphasis. I don't think it grows tired to do so one after the other like we just read, especially since here we're dealing with Luke the Evangelist. We've seen Luke in many different positions, but these two stories taken together justify Jesus' association with outcasts by appealing to the joy in heaven over the repentance of even one sinner, as we noted. Imagine where we would be today if we did the same, right? So what is this story doing is the question. And I'm not speaking about those four questions. If you remember the four questions to ask of a passage, what does this tell about God? What does this tell us about Jesus, about ourselves? And then what difference does this make? What do you think that the story is doing? And that's the question again for today. And it's doing this particularly. It is saying, you know how you feel if you're a herdsman and you find a lost sheep, put yourself in that position. Or if you're a housewife, and you recover a lost coin. Well, that's how God feels when a sinner repents and sit on that. That's what I say. I had a drum teacher back in college. Whenever I learned something conceptual, he'd say to sit on it. I do it. I say that to my students. They sometimes do it. I wish they'd always do it. But sit on that. If you remember, we're supposed to live in these pages. That's the experience of overhearing the gospel. Again, we're talking about narrative criticism, which allows us to engage in a careful reading of the text. The question is, can you share the joy in these passages? Will you join God and heaven's host in their rejoicing? Now, before we get on, continue on, that is, reading, going through the very last parable, I'm going to departure from what we usually do. Then we'll continue on with arguably the mo one of the most famous parables in inside and outside of Christianity. So I want you to hear these. I have a series of stories, and I want you to pay attention to your thoughts and to your attitudes. Pay attention to how I shift the camera in the story as well. Where's the camera in any given scene? Who is it focusing on? How close is it to the scene? Pay attention to how easily you hear these stories. Um, in your mind, relate this to the experience of a listener as if you're telling these yourself back to somebody else. Although the privilege is yours as a listener, I wouldn't fall asleep because we know whenever that happens, you might fall off a balcony like it says in Acts 10. So hear these stories, and these are Christian stories. There's 10 of them. I recall a class on parables from long ago in which students gravitated heavily towards the stories of a reversal type in which the offer of grace was extended to the wayward son, the publican, the 11th hour worker, and the servant who took big risks with the, uh, with the master's money. These students frowned on punishing lazy stewards, on slamming doors in the faces of poor girls who forgot to bring oil. In short, grace was no longer unexpected, but instead it was expected by these students. Hence, it was no longer grace. And if it was grace, it was cheap. So the professor read this story once without, ask, without any explanation, and he asked if it was a parable. So he said, there was a certain seminary professor who was very strict about due dates for papers. Due dates were announced at the beginning of the semester, and failure to meet them resulted in an F for the semester. In one class, three students did not meet the deadline. The first one explained, they said, Professor, unexpected guest came in from out of state the evening before the paper was due. I was unable to finish it. <laughs> then you receive an F, said the professor. The second student went up to him again, explained, on the, on the day that the paper was due, I became ill with influenza, and I was unable to complete it. Again, then you receive an F, this professor says. The second student explained, the third student, excuse me, 
Visibly shaken at the news about the fate of the other two, he cautiously approaches the professor's desk. Slowly he began, said, Professor, our first baby was due the same day that the paper was due. The evening before, my wife began having pains, so I rushed her to the hospital. Shortly after midnight, she gave birth to a boy. Our son weighs eight pounds. And the professor listened with interest. He moved his chair from back behind the desk. He looked up at the ceiling. And after a long pause, he looked across at the student and said, then you receive an F for the course. The news spread rapidly through the seminary. A large delegation of students came to the professor to protest. They said, why have you been so cruel and harsh to us? So he replied, at the beginning of the semester, I gave my word concerning papers. If the word of a teacher in a Christian seminary cannot be trusted, whose word can be trusted? The students were then dismissed. The students were not only angry with the professor in the story, but their professor for telling it. So therefore, they insisted that it wasn't a parable. Two, the impact of the biblical narrative in the Christian community is a testimony to the fact that once upon a time can be heard as a once and for all. And to abandon that narrative out of sincere desire to affect a once and for all experience is to surrender the arsenal and gone into battle with nothing more than good eye contact. So perhaps I character a bit, but I can recall a few years ago, there was a preacher sitting behind, beside a man from West Germany overhearing a Jew from England tell the story of a Jewish community in Poland. When the story ended, the German and the preacher turned to each other, paused in silence, and then moved out separately. Both of them had been addressed, confronted, encountered, called into question, and immensely reassured in their hope. Distance? Yes. Long ago and far away about Jews in, in Poland. Participation? Yes. They were also there. Number three. If you don't have reverence for God, if you talk glibly and casually about God, how can you pray? Hallowed, sacred, holy, sanctified is the name of God. No wonder they couldn't pronounce his name of God in Judaism in the first century. That's a hard name to say. When this preacher was a child, his mother would play word games with him in the evening by the fire. She taught him phonic spelling. If you can say it, you can spell it. And she led them into the deep waters of oviparous and hypotenuse and so on and so forth. He once knew how to pronounce and spell asphetida, but one word she never put on the list because she knew they were just children. She never put on the list God. Now recall your experience. Number four. The Bible calls it new birth. You've been to that window, haven't you? The maternity ward, the nursery, and all that stuff up there in the big window with all the men outside trying to figure out which one is theirs, you know. They say, she's in there somewhere, and I don't know but she's the prettiest one. You can read those little bands where the arms come down and there's a deep wrinkle and then there's a band and it's so small and you say, well, I think that's her. And the Bible says, that's what it is. That is it. Now we come to ones about our particular parable, the very last parable. I recall a man one night sitting in a rural church on a Sunday night. It was a summer meeting, so it was hot, humid, the window was open beside his pew. The minister was preaching on his favorite text. He was saying, Be not the first by whom one the new is tried, because a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, and it's better to be safe than sorry, because fools rush in where angels fear to tread. That was his sermon. And he was listening to him, drawn away, when a man came by the church building and stopped by that window. The man sitting in the pew asked, What is it? I'm listening to a sermon. He said, Come with me. Well... Where are you going? I know where there is a pearl of a great price that's more valuable than all the other pearls in the world. The man in the pew said, there's no such thing. He replied, in fact, where I'm going, there is treasure buried in a field. The man in the pew said, you're kidding. Where I'm going, bums are invited to sit down at the king's table. That's ridiculous. The man in the pew replied, in fact, they give great big parties for prodigals who come home. The man in the pew said, well, that's just stupid. Well, he listened to the rest of the sermon, and after it was over, he told the preacher about how he was disturbed and how that he hoped it didn't upset him during the sermon. The preacher said, who was that? The man in the pew said, 
I don't know, telling me all this fancy stuff. And he said, well, was he getting anybody? Well, none of our crowd went, but I noticed he had about 12 with him. So notice what that story is doing. Notice your experience while I'm reading this. Number six. There was a preacher who preached in Blue Ridge, the little town near where he lived and where he got his mail. He actually lives in Cherry Log, but he goes into Blue Ridge for the mail because, well, they have a post office at Cherry Log, but their mule died, and it's just hand-delivered, so it takes longer. So he preached in Blue Ridge while the minister was away, and he preached on the text for that Sunday, which was actually the prodigal son. A man after that service said, I didn't really care much for that, quite frankly. So the preacher said, well, why? Well, I guess it's not your sermon. I just don't like that story. What is it you don't like about it? He replies, it's not morally responsible. Well, what do you mean by that? He said, forgiving that boy. Well, what would you have done? He said, I think they, when he came home, he should have been arrested. And this fellow was serious. He's an attorney, the preacher thought. He thought he was going to tell him a joke, but he was actually really serious. He belonged to this unofficial organization nationwide. Never has any meetings and doesn't have a name, but it's a very strong network the preacher calls quality control people. They're the moral police. Mandatory sentences and no parole, mind you. And executions. The preacher said, what would you have given the prodigal? And so the man replied, six years. Number seven. There was a preacher I recall who lost his farm whenever he was a kid. They moved into a town to a little four-room house, a small house on a dirt street on the south side of the little town. They had one spigot out in the yard, but no water in the house, no electricity, and the toilet was out back. There was poor as Job's turkey, and they had a rough time. His sister was entering high school. She had trouble with her complexion when she was moving into her teens. You know, pockmarked face, always worrying about it and keeping her head down. She was bothered by it, and it was just terrible. One day in the mail, his sister got an invitation from Sue Ellen to a slumber party. Now, you don't know Sue Ellen, but she was the prettiest girl in high school. Her father was a wealthy businessman. They lived up on Main Street, and his sister got an invitation to her slumber party. And the preacher heard his sister, after she was 77 years old, speak of the importance of that, of receiving that, inv uh, that invitation. If I can drop a footnote here, if you are poor and you exclude prosperous people because you think that they're smart, or if you're prosperous and exclude the poor, you have a right to that, but it's not church. So now do you remember me speaking from verse 3 to verse 7 and then verse 8 to verse 10? These two parables, the first two parables before the prodigal son, they seem to repeat each other in their messages. So listen to this story, number 8. What is Luke doing by repeating these messages? Yes, sir. I don't know if, this, if I'm overanalyzing it, but the sheep is a wandering, like you mentioned, it's a wandering mm -hmm. soul, I guess. Mm -hmm. The coin is in it. You know, it's lost, but there's no, it's just lost by the owner hmm. or something to that effect. Is, is that overanalyzing it or should we should focus on the no, I don't think so. of finding it as what the message is really true? I'm arguing that it's a rejoicing, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yes, overanalyzing that part shouldn't yeah. have your finger into it. Because okay. we're asking why this main overarching point of why are these three stories connected in the first place. And also, if you remember reading from chapter 12, verse 49, into 13, verse 9, both these are a call to discipleship. They both speak of rejoicing. Yes. So there's a theme that's so interwoven through these. Rather than what is lost in that, mm -hmm. in that respect. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So whenever these two parables actually do repeat the, the sheep and the coin, just ask yourself, why are these, why do these seemingly say the same things? Why does Luke has to say this, have to say this two different ways? Number eight, just think of what a refrain will do. Consider some examples. Do you remember the funeral oration of Mark Antony at the grave of Julius Caesar in Shakespeare's play? He says, friends, Romans, countrymen, I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. The noble Brutus had told you Caesar was ambitious, and Brutus was an honorable man. And he talks a while, and then he says, and Brutus is an honorable man. And then he talks some more. And then Brutus is an honorable man. After about six or five or, or seven of, and Brutus was an honorable man, the crowd is screaming. They hate the phrase, and Brutus is an honorable man. 
Because they now hate Brutus, they are screaming, kill. Now what did it? A refrain. For the task of the refrain is to move the burden of speech away from the speaker onto the listener so that the listener is in on it. An oral presentation has to travel kind of light. And it doesn't have very long to achieve its task of getting to the group to say, well, that's what we believe. A refrain can do it. Take the saloon song, the old saloon song, <coughs> Frankie and Johnny. It was 1929. Do you know Frankie and Johnny? Shame on you if you do. But I'll make an allusion in quotations. <laughs> Frankie and Johnny was originally Frankie and Albert. But it didn't have a ring to it, so it's changed to Frankie and Johnny. Now I want you to listen to the refrain. And I'll go through a part of it. Listen to the refrain and the function of the refrain. That's our question. Frankie, and jo Frankie, she was a good woman. And Johnny, he was her man. And every silver dollar that Frankie made went in straight into Johnny's hand. He was her man, but he'd done her wrong. Uh-oh. You see, something's going to happen. You just don't know what it is yet. Frankie and Johnny went walking. Johnny wore a new linen suit. Cost me a hundred, said Frankie. But don't my John... My Johnny look cute. He was her man, but he done her wrong. Frankie went down to the corner, and she ordered a thimble of gin. She said to the fat bartender, has my loving Johnny been in? He was her man, but he done her wrong. Ain't gonna tell you no story. Ain't gonna tell you no lie. Johnny was here about an hour ago with a floozy named Nellie Bly. He was her man, but he done her wrong. Uh-oh, right? It's coming now. But I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. I'm pretty sure it's in the Methodist hymnal, you can find the words. But that refrain, it creates anticipation. It builds to the act itself, you see. Maybe think of the refrain of the preaching of MLK Jr. I have a dream, over and over, in more recent history. Until everybody in the country says it. Five times he says, let freedom ring. And then the, the whole country says it. He says, I have a dream. How did he do it? By refrain. MLK knew the tune as well as the words to that sermon, and Luke here does the same thing. Now watch this. Number nine. Some of you have heard me describe in detail a nine-pound sparrow walking down the street in front of my house, and I asked the sparrow, I said, aren't you a little heavy? The sparrow said, yeah, that's why I'm out walking, trying to get some of this weight off. And I said, well, why don't you fly? The sparrow looked at me like I was stupid and said, fly. I've never flown, I could get hurt. And so what I said, I said, what's your name? And he replied, church. Now our last story will come after the lesson. Our last story in our text, the prodigal son is perhaps the best known of the gospel stories. So now it focuses on two parts. We are in verses 11 to 32 now. It focuses on two parts. One focusing on the son and one on the elder brother. In both parts of this parable, the focus is on first on the son and then the father. So in the first part, the younger son, and then the father. The second part, the elder son, and then again, the father. Notice those. And I've heard many, many lessons where a preacher or a teacher will pose this, us, us, the audience, as one of those characters. But today I'm arguing that there's another element to this story. So in the first part of the story, the portrayal of the prodigal son evokes negative feelings. The boy treats his father as if he was dead, the younger brother. According to the laws of property, it was possible for children to receive a division of their father's capital during his lifetime. But a son had the right of disposal of the property only after the father's death. Again, evoking a negative uh, portrayal. The prodigal son had dissipated his means of caring for his father in, a case, in case a necessity arose which is verses 18 and 21. He had violated the commandment to honor one's father and mother. Ultimately, this is Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5. Now in verses 15 and 16, he associated with the Gentile. Instead of going to the Jewish community for help, the younger son did. He had, moreover, he made his living in what for a Jew was a sinful way, feeding pigs. The polite way a Mideasterner gets rid of unwanted hangers-on is by assigning him a task that they know that they will refuse. Not even this work, which practically precluded the, the practice of his religion, got rid of this youth, of the younger brother. Here then is a portrait of a despicable youth about whom one's feelings are similar to those of a Pharisee or a tax collector. He was uncouth and unclean, uncontemptible. Now again in this first part, the portrayal of the father 
evokes amazement, actually. So we have a negative portrayal of the younger son, and the father in here is now evoking amazement. The father would have been expected to refuse the younger son's request, right? But instead, he grants it. This is verse 12. He expected, the expected response from this father upon the younger son returned home is mirrored in the prodigal son's request. So notice there's a contrast here. The son says in verse 19, treat me as one of your hired servants. Now a typical Jewish father might have considered this expedient until the son's reformation had been confirmed. He's been transformed, right? To take him back into the family. It would moreover allow the youth to make reparations required by repentance. Remember the theme of repentance going all throughout uh, Luke. We see that particularly in chapter 19, verse 8. But instead, what did the father do? The father came out of the house and in a dramatic demonstration showed an unexpected love and publicly, even to the point of humiliating himself. His actions were without restraint. It says that he ran. This is verse 20. The father ran. In those times, the time that Jesus is telling us this uh, parable, telling the Pharisees' this parable, I should say, running in that way would have been seen as beneath his dignity. There's an extra biblical text which says, and he would have known this, a man's manner of walking tells you what he is. And this is the honor-shame uh, culture that they live in as well. But the father ran. The father ran to him. Now the second half. Remember, we talked about the father and the son. There's amazement with the father. That of, of, uh, the portrayal of the father evokes amazement here. The portrayal of the younger son uh, has an, uh, evokes uh, negativity. And here we're going to have the father and then the elder son in this part. So we see a parallel portrayal, actually, between these two sons. Now we're talking about the elder brother. In addressing his father, verse 9, the elder brother, with no title, the elder brother insults his father publicly. He accuses his father of rank favoritism, verses 29 and 30. He declares that he is not a part of the family. Whenever, he, whenever the elder brother says, my friends in, in, in 29, and this son of yours, as if he's removed from this family somehow. And lastly, if all that is left belongs to this older brother, and if he complains about not being able to dispose of it yet as he wants to do, then he also wants the father dead and gone. In other words, although the elder son has carried out his orders, verse 29, the second half, he has been lawless within the law, not physically, but spiritually. If the prodigal son was an overt sinner, the elder brother has been a covert one. He's certainly not a lovable figure, although, like I said before, we may empathize with him. Isn't that true? Because, again, if a preacher or a teacher puts you in that position, how would you feel, right? And lastly, in our comparison, the father is provocative once more in the second part of the story. Uh, negative portrayal with the younger son. Uh, evokes amaze the father is evoking amazement through his actions, and then we see a negative portrayal with the elder son. Now, the father's once again being provocative. Reacting to the elder brother's anger, the father goes out. This is verse 28 and says, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to make merry and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. It's verses 31, 32. So given the context of the statement, uh, the statement should be taken to mean that it was a divine necessity to rejoice over the recovery of the lost. Again, like we said, verse 7, verse 10, verse, uh, what else, uh, 24, and uh, so I, <laughs> I can't remember the last verse. 32. 32, thank you. So what have we been talking about? Joy is the appropriate response to a sinner's repentance. Joy, that is defined by God's behavior. So how does this, let me just tie this all together. How does the story fit in with the other two? The joy in heaven over a sinner's repentance is greater than a shepherd's happiness over the recovery of a lost sheep. That's verse 7. There's joy in heaven over a sinner's repentance, just as there is when a woman finds her lost coin. And lastly, heaven rejoices over a sinner's reclamation, just as the father did over the return of the prodigal, even though it's difficult to accept. So again, what's the question? What is this story doing? Again, put that before you. The question is, will you share in that communal joy? So I suppose that you've noticed that some people will celebrate anything. And I think it's remarkable, actually. She calls and says, you know that diet that I've been on for two years? Well, yes. 
Well, the scale said I lost five pounds. I thought we'd have a few friends and I made chocolate fudge cake. I bought a gallon of strawberry ice cream. We want to celebrate this. He calls and says, you know, our plumbing has been backed up for days. Well, the roto rooter man finally came. He hasn't unclogged. Everything's flushing. Thought we'd have new folk in and celebrate. Some people will celebrate anything. But I must say to you, there's some times when I can't go to the party. It's not because I looked over the guest list and somebody will be there that I don't like. If you have that attitude, you'll never go to a party because there's always somebody there you don't like. It's not your list. You're the guest. It's not because I think that the party is premature either, as some people do. Never celebrate anything because they say it's too early to have that party. A baby is born. Well, it's too early. You never know how he'll turn out. A wedding? Well, you know if they'll never stay married. Good grades? Well, you better hold off. He hasn't graduated yet. There are some people who think all celebrations are premature. I'm not one of those. I simply can't go to some parties just because the occasion for celebration. I can't handle it. Such parties seem inappropriate. There was a man who was diagnosed after a long delay, his wife fussing at him forever and ever about going to a doctor. He finally went. The large tumor in his leg was malignant. The chemo started, and he was visit visited in the hospital. He was rather upbeat. He was going to get well. The doctor said, one way we can stave it off is to remove the leg. They took his leg off just above the knee, and he sent out invitations. A few friends gathered. The leg was buried, but I just couldn't go. A denial party produces a kind of giddiness in people that isn't celebratory. I just couldn't go. The scriptures tell us repeatedly that there are some things that God cannot celebrate. God cannot celebrate the death of the wicked, even though I know ministers in church seem to enjoy that, looking over the banister of heaven, seeing the wicked in the pit, and saying, you got what came to you. God cannot do that. Remember my story of the preacher? Okay. There are some times... You just don't think you can make it to a party. One such time comes to mind with this text. It's going to be a good party. Kill the fatted calf. The fatted calf, not those little hors d'oeuvres. I mean, we're talking about serious food here. Plenty of food. Not those little triangles, you know, those cucumber sandwiches. Is that what those cucumber sandwiches? No, it's going to be a good party. Live band. It always fires it up. I don't care what kind of party it is. If you have live music, not some DJ playing records, I mean a real band tuning up their instruments, and here we go. It's going to be a good party. Live band. We're just going to be dancing. You don't, know, have to, you don't have to know how to dance anymore, you know. It used to be when you went to a dance, you said, have to know how to dance. It's going to be a nice party. And all the invitations said was, welcoming home our son. Well, that's always occasion for celebration, welcoming home the son. I don't know where he's been. Where's he been? College? Welcome home the sun. Spend the summer here, we'll fatten you up. That's good. Where he's been to? I don't know. Peace Corps? I'm always moved by young people volunteering to give two years of their lives back in the peak of their youth, two years in some remote place of the world, live to work and serve people. It's marvelous, isn't it? Is that it? Again, you say, welcome home, son. What is it? I don't know, maybe he's sick, maybe several months in the Mayo Clinic up there, you know, they have houses nearby for families to stay. Stayed there four months, had some strange disease, you know, the bone marrow transplant worked. He's coming home. Welcome home, son. So then you say, this is going to be a really great party. Where's he been? You don't know where he's been. He's been eating with the hogs, living with the hogs, acting like a hog. Took every penny of his inheritance and blew it on wine, women, and song. Paid out hundreds of dollars to women who sell their favors. Lost his clothes, lost his job. Can't find a job except slopping some pigs. And now, once in a while, you can see him over there eating with the pigs. He's abandoned his religion. He's trampled on everything that his parents taught him. He's been in a far country. Then why is he coming home? Because he's hungry. You get down and out. I don't care how much pride you have. Sooner or later, you're going to come home. When you hit the wall, you're going to come home. When you hit bottom, you're going to come home. It's not like it used to be. Sit at the dinner table and discuss whether you're going to see the opera or a Shakespearean play. It's a matter of, is there anything to eat? He needs a bed and a bath and a meal. That's why he's home. We all come back whenever it gets hard enough, don't we? In fact, some people not only come back, but they get religion too. You can ask every prison ward in the country. Oh yeah, they can strut around and say, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. But when they hear the gate clang behind them, they want the chaplain, and they want the Bible, and they find Jesus. Oh yeah, oh yeah, they come back 
when it really, really gets rough. That's why he's home. And why are they having a party? That seems absolutely inappropriate that you would have a party. Let him come home. I think the parents ought to let him come home. I don't care what they've done. Let him come home. But come in the back door. Eat in the kitchen. Lay low for a while. Get work clothes on. And get out back there in the field and earn your place again. Earn the respect of your neighbors. Earn the respect of your brother. Your family. But a party. I think that party is a little premature and inappropriate. You know the woman that celebrated losing five pounds? I saw her in the grocery. She's gained it back and at least 20 more. It doesn't last long. You remember the party we had where that fellow who celebrated six months of sobriety? Haven't up to a drop in six months. Let's have a party. Saw it in the paper. Arrested for public drunkenness. They go back around. You remember the party where we had for the fellow who got out of jail? Now he's come home, gets a few good meals, gets a change of clothes, and you know what? You know what? A party. That seems absolutely non-serious. What he's done is serious. I think he needs to be taught a lesson. If you want my advice, my advice is to teach that young man a lesson. You can't teach the, a lesson when you have tables filled with food. Come in, make yourself several sandwiches. I want to teach you a lesson. That's contradiction. Music dancing. Mom and dad is out on the floor doing the Charleston saying, son, we're going to teach you a lesson. Where is the lesson in that? There's no lesson in that. I think he needs to be taught a lesson. And when you pile up the tables with food, bring in a live band, have a big dance floor and everybody dancing, what is the lesson that is taught? The only thing, and I'm honest with you here, the only thing I can imagine that he's being taught is this. We love you. We forgive you. We're glad you're home. That's all I can think of. Is that enough for a party? Well, here's the last story. There was a preacher that told some of his friends what a shocking thing it was to discover that he had not really heard the story of the prodigal son. When he preached to those sermons about coming from the far country and bringing the ring and the robe, killing the fatted calf, bring musicians, there's a party, and there's music and dancing and all of that. He preached that sermon as though it was the wonderful, natural, easy, and right thing to do. He would never thought about that party until a family up the street divorced and left three or four uh, youngsters, girls, one of them attractive, prematurely mature and about 14 years old, but she was a truant at school, always in trouble, always up before the judge, chasing around and hanging on the tail end of every motorcycle that went by roaring through the neighborhood. She was finally so truant and so involved in misdemeanors that the judge said, you're going to the reform school. She was sent away to a detention home for girls. About the fourth or fifth month, that she was there, she gave birth to the child that she was carrying, and she was only 15 at the time. So word came to this neighborhood some months afterward that she was coming home. Will she have the baby with her? Is she really coming back home, back to our neighborhood? The day they heard that she was to come, all of them in the neighborhood had to mow their grass. They were out in their yards mowing their grass and watching the house. She didn't show though, nobody came. And they kept watching the house and mowing the grass. The preacher was down to about a blade at a time, you know, watching the house when a car pulled into the driveway and out steps, it's Kathy. She has a baby. She's brought home the baby. People in the house ran out, grabbed her, took turns holding that baby, and they were all laughing and joking, and then they went in. Another car pulled in, then another car pulled in, and then another one. They started parking in the street. You couldn't have gotten a Christian car down the street, just cars on either side. They're all gathering there, you know. Suddenly, he got disturbed and anxious and went into his house. It suddenly struck him. What if one of them saw me down in the yard and said, Hey, she's home and she has a baby. We're giving a party, and we'd like for you and your wife to come. Well, I've got lessons to write in all sermons on Sunday. What do you have got? If you live next door to the prodigal son's father's house, but you've gone over to the party. It's easier to preach on that than to go to the party. So hopefully, through that demonstration, you can see exactly what a story does, how a story functions. That is why I've told so many, I need you to pay attention to not only your insights, the experience of the listener, but also the experience of the teller in conjunction with this. Why this is a call to discipleship is in these two places matters. You can contrast and compare these things, relate these to other people. Next week, 
depending on what Bill has you doing, I would read chapter 18 of Luke. Our specific passage is Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. But again, I would go ahead and read the whole chapter. And he will be speaking uh, on the experience of the teller, the teller of this story. So let us end here just with a word in prayer, if you wouldn't mind bowing with me. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we are able to be here and experience this gospel as overhears. We are able to overhear this conversation, this this deep and intriguing conversation. We know the Bible is good history, but it's also awesome literature. And it takes time to read these things and to do a, a proper close reading of these. And I pray that for these people, as they, as they go out, they're able to read such stories in a way that glorifies you so they may teach them to others who know the gospel, preach them to those who have heard the gospel as well, so we may interact with these characters, get inside of the story, and live in these pages. And it is with that in mind, and in your son's name that we pray, amen.